binge eating behavior is essentially people are starving themselves for this extended period of time. They're like relying on this willpower, right? It's like 4 a.m. club and you know, all this stuff you see on, on Instagram and on social media. I'm gonna wake up at 4 a.m. I'm gonna work out right away. I'm gonna have my kale smoothie for breakfast. And they last for like a couple weeks maybe. And then when willpower starts to give out and they start feeling bad, you just get these overwhelming cravings. And then that's where you start to see the binging behavior. And in reality, this is actually not that great because what's happening is you're causing some damage to the metabolism. And it's not that it's not irrecoverable damage, but you're basically lowering the metabolism through the stress hormones, the fasting, the lack of carbs. And then you're then feasting, having this huge binging period where you're going to put on water weight, and you're going to start to refill glycogen and you go back to that starving again. So it's like this up and down. And over time, I think this starts to actually create a lot of weight issues and metabolic issues for many women, and many people in general. I'm Kitty Bloomfield, co-founder of New Strength and Saturay, creator of pro-metabolic food supplements and seriously saturated skincare. And today I've got Mike Fave on the podcast. He's an independent researcher and I met him doing a podcast with him and Danny and who else did we do the podcast with? Jay. Jay, that's it. Jay Feldman. Sorry. I was, it was on the tip of my tongue. Um and he's just a great guy and super knowledgeable. And I thought I would be awesome to get him on the podcast. So welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to jumping into our topic today. Yeah, we were just sort of going back and forth. like, oh, what can we talk about? What can we talk about? And I was just thinking, um, uh, talk about sugar and juice. Because I think, you know, a lot of women who come into our program, they've come from a background of restrictive dieting like me. They've cut sugar completely from their diet. They're so, they think that sugar is poison and it's the devil. Uh, and they're so eat, so afraid, you know, to eat sugar. And they put, you know, a glass of orange juice on par with the can of soft drink. So let's talk about that. But just before we start, just want to tell everyone a bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Of course. Yeah, thank you. So I started out in the alternative health sphere and diet spheres when I was younger. And I went through all the dietary journey that all of, many of us go through, right? So bodybuilding, plant-based, low carb, keto, intermittent fasting, carnivore. So I went through all those. And while I was kind of going through all of that, I was reading research. Eventually I started reading research directly instead of reading books and articles mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I also, along the way, I was working in the hospital as a nurse, uh, a large portion of the time I was there I was working in the ICU, especially during COVID. And then I was also working with clients along the way, helping people to organize diet, supplement, get their hormones right, get their gut right, things like this. And then now I'm full-time into health consulting and helping people organize their lifestyle, their diets, their supplementation so that they can improve sleep, they can improve their digestion, they can lose weight, they can recover from these crazy diets that all of us do and everything within that sphere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was interesting when we were all chatting about the stuff that we've done. It's just crazy. Like I, I, I sometimes like I cringe when I think about the things <laughs> that I did. Like I remember once I ate, I mean, this is not even a bloody diet. This is just being stupid, but I ate tuna and apples once for 12 weeks straight, you know, just shit like that. I'd have these epic binges and then the next day I'd just eat protein, only protein, nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the diet sphere, the diet cultures create these fear responses around different foods. And when people start to get into that fear psychology, they are unable to actually step back and rationally look at what they're doing and say, you know, what am I doing like this? This whole setup is a little bit crazy. And then also they are unable to look and say, like, I have these, I cured some of these symptoms, right? Or I got rid of some of these symptoms, right? I get rid, I go on carnivore, I go on keto, my bloating goes away. But it's like, well, now I can't sleep through the night. And now I have anxiety. And then when they go reach out to other people, other people have them double down. And they say, oh, you just need to eat less carbs. And it's like, I'm already eating five grams of carbs a day. It's like, you need to eat less. <laughs> you need to eat mm. one gram of carb a day, or you need to increase the fat, or you need to take in more salt instead of saying, okay, Maybe there's some problems with what I'm doing. And I think it's, it, we develop as we're going through, cause we don't really know the mechanisms that in depth, I know I started that way. And then I started as like, okay, if I really want to situate my diet, I'm really going to have to understand what's going on. And so we, we get into that fear response. We can't take this objective look at it. And then we kind of spin our wheels for a little while with it, double down until eventually it's like, nope, this isn't working. And then we jump ship, right? So it's like, you go from plant-based 
and then you go to keto and then you go to carnivore. And after carnivore, you jump into bioenergetic and you spend a little time with the milk and orange juice stuff. And you start to realize, well, some of this doesn't work, but some of this really improved my health. And then people are like, okay, well, now what do I do? What do I do? I'm, I can't go back to carnivore or keto. And I can't, uh, I, I like the bioenergetic stuff. There's some benefits here, but I'm still having some struggles. And I think that's when they reach out to, you know, somebody like me or somebody like yourself so that they can have some type of direction and some type of organization on how do I do this diet thing? How do I improve my health? How do I get to this, this ideal weight that I'm shooting for? How do I sleep through the night without having to go back to these crazy diets that I was doing before and, and go back into this fear-based mentality around food? Mm. Yeah, I know it does. It's, it really, it's just crazy. I, I think back to what I used to eat and what I eat now and how much more food freedom I have and how much I just enjoy food now, which is, you know, I, th I think about a lot of the women when they come into our program, you know, that just stopping the binge eating and actually having a better relationship with food. Cause you should enjoy food. Like food is amazing. Obviously it's fuel for your body, but you know, you share food with friends and family. I, and I genuinely look forward to you know, all my meals like today, this week I'm having a, I made this yummy chicken curry with rice cooked in chicken broth and I'm having mango, like mangoes are in season here in Australia and it's so delicious. Ice cream before bed every night. People always message me like, oh, I just love how you talk about foods. I just love food. Like I really like cooking and I love food. So it's really exciting. Chocolate brownies, you know. Um, so no, it's, yeah, it is so amazing helping all of these people improve their health, but also just be able to eat real delicious food again. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really great point. I think that there's, there's a time and place for figuring out which foods work and how to set up your macros and your calories and cover your micronutrients. But once you get that foundation down, then you can start taking it to the next level and you start to actually create, you know, tasty recipes and different <laughs> food combinations that work for you. And you start to figure out which foods actually work for your body. Right. Cause we all have some individuality on what we tolerate. And so it's more about let's find these principles, let's mm. dial the principles in, and then let's start to choose foods that work for us. And then we can actually make a relatively decent diet that tastes good, that we enjoy, mm. that helps us to achieve our goals, whether that's weight loss, whether that's sleeping, digestive problems, whatever the deal is, mm. and then not have to be so extremely restrictive. And a lot of times when I work with my clients, it's not about being optimal or perfect all the time. It's about whatever circumstance you're in, you do the best that you can. And so, because if you're too strict and too stringent, number one, you can't be consistent. And I think both of us would agree consistency is absolutely essential to this entire process. You know, once you get your diet dialed in, you're consistent with it. That's where you start to see that pound per week weight loss. You start to see the digestive symptoms start to go away or the cycle becomes more regular. And so in those circumstances, if you make something that you can do all the time, that you can sustainably go about it, then you start to see better benefits. And if you're super restrictive and you you can't eat anything and there's like four foods on your list or whatnot. And I think people mm. get to that. And then when they finally, you know, jump into the bioenergetic sphere, that's one of the things like, oh, finally I have like some variety and I have some things that I actually enjoy eating. So there's, there's multiple mentalities that go into this. Uh, but I don't think that it, you have to be so restricted that you can't enjoy really tasty recipes and really good food on a regular basis. And then in terms of our, the topic that we we're going to cover is the sugar piece. I, you can have sugar, you can have carbohydrates in the diet and still achieve these results. If anything, you want to achieve these results, then having adequate carbohydrates, I think is essential to this. Agree. Agree. And how many times, and you would hear this from women, you, know, you cut the sugar and carbs from your diet and then you fall off the bloody wagon. You know, I remember one time eating, sitting outside the gym and eating eight crunchy bars in one sitting. Because I was so, <laughs> I used to smash these bloody Jersey caramels in, in Australia. There's a supermarket called Woolworths. It's like a home brand and they're just glucose syrup and heaps of other shit. But I would just eat packets of them and then feel sick. So, you know, I think, and so many women tell me the same thing. Like once I actually, I, met, I interviewed this woman, she'd done our program on the podcast and she had done all of this like work on this binge eating. She thought she had this binge eating disorder and, you know, she'd done on a hypnotherapy and all this other shit. And then she came into the program and she said, when I actually ate adequate carbs and sugar, it just nearly instantly stopped. Yep. That is something that I see as well. Most of my client base, I'd say 60, 70% is also women. So mm -hmm. it's, the, I get the same types of statements and the same types of challenges that you guys are seeing. Mm -hmm. And 
I think the binge eating behavior is essentially people are starving themselves for this extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And then their will out, they're like relying on this willpower, right? It's like 4 a.m. club and, you know, all this stuff you see on, on Instagram and on social media. I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m. I'm going to work out right away. And mm -hmm. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to have my kale smoothie for breakfast. And they last for like a couple of weeks, maybe. And then when willpower starts to give out and they start feeling bad, you just get these overwhelming cravings. And then that's where you start to see the binging behavior. And in reality, this is actually not that great because what's happening is you're causing some damage to the metabolism. And it's not that it's not recoverable, like irrecoverable damage, but you're basically lowering the metabolism through the stress hormones, the fasting, through the lack of carbs. And then you're, you're then feasting, having this huge binging uh, period where you're going to put on water weight and you're going to start to refill glycogen and you go back to that starving again. So it's like this up and down. And over time, I think this starts to actually create a lot of weight issues and metabolic issues for mm -hmm. many women, and many people in general. And it's because mm -hmm. you're in these, like feasting famine cycles all the time. Mm -hmm. And something that you said that I see all the time as well is when you have adequate protein, you have adequate carbs, you have adequate fat, calories are dialed in appropriately across the day, then people don't binge anymore. There's no yeah. need to binge because you're eating all the carbohydrates, sugar, and fat that your body needs. And those cravings for binging, the cravings in general, is your body telling you, hey, where's the fuel? <laughs> where's yeah. the car? Where's the fat? We don't have enough fuel on board for our functions. Yeah, no, totally. I 100% um, agree with that. And it just, yeah, it's, it blows my mind still. And I think it's so amazing. And I just love to see women, you know, get off because it, it consumes you. Like I've been there and it just, all you do is you think about what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you're going to have for your cheat day. Then you feel guilty. And then you restrict more the next day and you just stay stuck in this constant cycle. So yeah, it's pretty bloody exhausting. So anyway, let's talk about sugar. So first of all, what is sugar? Yes. So <laughs> sugar is essentially, it's, car it's a carbohydrate and there's multiple different types. The main ones that we're going to see in our diet are going to be glucose and fructose. Oftentimes it could be just glucose. This is something that we would see in starches. So that'd be like potatoes, rice yams, cassava, bread, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then you have fructose, which is oftentimes com combined with glucose in the form of sucrose or just in free form together. And that's where you see things in honey, maple syrup, table sugar, fruits, juices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And basically the sugars are a fuel source. Our body uses these, these molecules as an energy source so that we can produce ATP in the mitochondria. So our mitochondria, the powerhouse of our cells, can actually produce energy. Now you can use fats and you, you can also use fats as an energy source, but there's some problems with relying primarily on fats as an energy source. And we can get into that in just a few minutes, but the sugar is a fuel source. Uh, it's a type of carbohydrate. You can also have starches. An interesting side note is all of the starches break down into sugar. They break down into pure glucose in the body. So there's nothing massively special about them in terms of you know something that's pure glucose besides the speed in which it hits your system. And then maybe some of the vitamins and minerals that come with it. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all, all of the carbohydrates, whether it's sugar or starch, whether it's glucose or fructose is actually an energy source. And we can talk about, you know, I'm going to leave, the, I'll leave the floor here, but we can talk about there's some differences between glucose and fructose as well and how they're metabolized. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about that. Cause I think, um, you know, fructose is very demonized as well, which is crazy. So talk about, yeah. 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 This, this is a great question. This is a great topic. Cause this is, you know, I just did a podcast with Paul Saldino. We were just mm -hmm. talking about, uh, Dr. Lustig who is completely anti-fructose and the, the low carb sphere is plastering the anti-fructose stuff all over the place. And then on mm -hmm. the Ray P forum, you see this, all this anti-fructose stuff going on now. So fructose and glucose are both simple sugars. They're called monosaturides. So it just means mono meaning one, they're not bound to something else. Mm. Now, fructose and glucose are almost exactly the same, except for some minor changes in their structure. And the minor changes in their structure actually change how they're metabolized a bit. And mm. so glucose inside, even in the low carb spheres, and even in the any of the regular dietary spheres, doesn't really get that demonized rep because the way it's metabolized is controlled in the cell. So when it run, when the cell takes in glucose and starts to use it, the pathway that it runs through has a rate limiting step on it. Meaning there's a, there's a, a blocker or a controller 
on how the glucose is metabolized. Mm -hmm. Now with fructose, you don't actually see that controller. So fructose just comes in and it can just start moving to be metabolized. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that because fructose has that function, it can create or it has that process it can create some dysfunction metabolically. Now, inside cell studies and inside some of the rat studies, or even inside some really poorly constructed human studies, mm. we can see the problem with fructose. And what do, what do I mean by poorly constructed studies is we're going to take a human, we're going to inject large volumes of fructose into their bloodstream, which you would never see under normal circumstances, mm. or we're going to give these humans really high fructose intakes uh, that they they can absorb in their intestine, and then the bacteria in their intestine start getting a hold of that fructose and producing toxins that can then damage the liver and metabolism. So when you see problems in some of these fructose studies, and you see how they're set up in humans and also in the the animals like mice, you see okay, this doesn't really equate to what people are doing on a regular basis, and it definitely doesn't equate to things like fruits and 100% fruit juices which come number one, come with glucose, which eliminates some of the problems of fructose absorption. And then number two comes with vitamins, minerals, and then these beneficial plant compounds, the polyphenol compounds that modulate the microbiome in a beneficial way and also alter metabolism at the intestine and at the liver. So these are, when you see the demonization of fructose, mm. it, it's not comparable number one to carbohydrates in general, which includes starches and pure glucose sources, and then number two, it also is not comparable to what we see with fruits and 100% juices and things along these lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And so talk a bit more about like, why do you think sugar became so demonized? And to the point where, you know, because I think people, they say to me, oh, yeah, but, you know, white sugar is poison, but the sugar found in fruit and honey, it's not poison. I'm like, well, it's the same. It's still breaks down to the same thing. It just is, doesn't have any nutrients or fiber. So it's yeah. so interesting. And not that I'm, we're suggesting that you should go out and get all of your carbohydrates from white sugar, because that would be silly because you would have no nutrients, but yeah. having some white sugar in a nutrient rich diet is completely fine and it's not poison. Yeah. Talk, talk a bit more about that. Yeah. That's a great question. Those are also really good points. So I think the sugar started to become demonized because inside Western countries, we have this explosion of obesity, diabetes, and all these different metabolic syndrome diseases. And basically the researchers were trying to look for different causes for these disease processes, right? So we have this, the lipid hypothesis where you see it's saturated fat, it's cholesterol, that's what's causing these problems. And then you have this other camp that's saying, no, it's the sugars, it's the granulated sugar, it's the high fructose corn syrup that's causing the problem. And inside the bioenergetic sphere, people are talking about there's multiple components that are causing the problem, the polyunsaturated fats, issues with toxins from the intestine, uh, issues with toxins from different plant foods and whatnot. So it's kind of more of a multifactorial approach, more kind of a more holistic approach than just, oh, it's cholesterol, oh, it's saturated fat or oh, it's sugar. And so sugar and fructose, particularly fructose, was started to be singled out as one of these major causative factors. And then the low carb diet sphere has picked that up and run with it because it supports their idea that carbohydrates in general are the problem, which I don't think is really supported by the research and is the case, especially, I mean, both you and I are eating high carbohydrate diets, not dealing with any obesity, any diabetes, any types of these metabolic issues. Both of us are lean, both of us are, you know, working out and able to maintain the podcast schedule and working with clients, et cetera. And also many of our clients, I would say, are also losing weight and improving metabolic function mm -hmm. with higher carbohydrate diets. So I don't think it's the carbs and I definitely don't think it's fructose alone, but this what they're starting to say, like, maybe this is one of the problems. And I think the reason that they pick up on this or that they picked up on sugars and they picked up on fructose is because you see this in, at, for a period of time, you saw an increase of simple carbohydrate intake in the diet. Because when they started to put that low or, or the low fat diet craze in with the lipid hypothesis, we want to avoid saturated fats, we want to minimize cholesterol, then they started creating low fat food options, which were much higher in these refined carbohydrate sources like granulated sugar or refined starches and whatnot. And so when people start to eat that, we start to see problems metabolically. Now they say it's the sugar, mm. but I think part of it is the sugar is coming wrapped up in these processed foods. 
And so when somebody thinks about a food that's sugary, you think cake, you think cookies, you think donuts, you think mm -hmm. things like this. And that's not just sugar. There is mm -hmm. sugar in there, but there's also a variety of toxic industrial ingredients. There's mm -hmm. a variety of heated polyunsaturated fats. And you also have a ton of refined starches as well. So it's like kind of like this bomb of problematic components. And we just want to say it's the sugar. The other thing you see is this refined or this sugar sweetened beverage is what they call them, a massive increase in, in that intake. And there's someone say, okay, maybe this is what's causing the metabolic dysfunction. Now, as you mentioned, if we were to get most of our carbohydrate intake from these refined sugar sources, we would cause problems. One of the major ones that you mentioned, which I agree with, is that you start to get a lack of nutrient density. So you don't have enough vitamins and minerals. The other problem though, is that you don't have those polyphenolic compounds. And then you can start to create a dysbiosis in the intestine. And then the bacterial products from the intestine also start to poison the system. So you have this old uh, effect and it's not necessarily because sugar is evil. Because if you, if you absorb the sugar and you don't have the microbiome dysbiosis and you have enough nutrients, you'll process it effectively. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the nutrients and you have the dysbiosis and you're producing these metabolic products and you don't have the plant compounds, then you mm -hmm. also start to see a change in how the sugar is metabolized because you have all of these factors going on. And you see this in the fructose studies, uh, the mm -hmm. fructose studies specifically. Now, the reason they honed in on fructose instead of just on glucose is because when you feed animals and human starch in these different diets, you actually don't see the same level of dysfunction that you see if you feed pure fructose or tons of sucrose. And mm -hmm. so that's why they focused on the fructose alone. But when you feed fruits and 100% juices, you also don't see those same problems, especially in the context of a whole foods nutrient dense diet. So it's, we have to be careful when we're looking here and saying, oh, fructose is a problem or sugar is a problem because it's, there's more factors that are coming with it that are confounding it. Mm. And, it and we're saying, oh, it's this, but it's like, look at what's coming along with that, right? And no one, mm. if, if we're, the, the dietary approach that we're espousing that we talk about isn't, you know, go eat Entenmann's pound cakes and, yeah, and donuts. Donut. And yeah, yeah, but yeah it, it, it's totally like, I, I always like what resonates with me or makes sense to me. It's not the sugar. That's the issue. It's what it's delivered with. Exactly. So like, you know, you, you're eating, I don't know, like fucking a donut that has some sugar, but it has a ton of vegetable oil, flour, no nutrients versus you drink a glass of orange juice still has the sugar. You know, because white sugar comes from the cane sugar plant. Like it's a plant. It's still the same stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it's like you think about that. Like when I, when people come into our program, they're like most, not all, but the type two diabetes, they've been eating a lot of processed foods with vegetable oils in them, as well as the flour and the sugar and not enough nutrients. And it's so interesting once you, you know, oh, actually, did you see that? You know, that movie um, where that guy, what was it? I can't remember what it was bloody called. And he ate, you know, did so many days of eating, like adding more sugar into his diet. And he, but he, but he ate, um, like cereals and bars and like all this sort of processed foods. It wasn't from like sugar and fruit. And what was it called? You would remember it. I know it. that there was Super Size Me where they did the McDonald's thing. Yeah. No, it wasn't Super Size. It was another one. And he, and I, what was interesting, what we did is we looked at the amount of grams of sugar in his diet and then looked at like Danny Roddy's because this was ages ago, years ago on Craig's. And they were actually eating more sugar, but didn't have any of the issues that he had. So it's like, well, is it actually the sugar that's the issue? No, I, at least for me, I don't see the sugar as a problem, especially when I have clients who are losing weight and improving metabolic function while mm. increasing carbohydrate in the diet. Again, it's not granulated sugar. We're using mm. things like whole fruits. We're using some hundred percent fruit juice. We're mm. also using starches. So that could be mm. things like rice, potatoes, yams, et cetera. Mm. And then we're also, another thing that's really important with all of this is looking at somebody's total energy requirement. That's so right. if somebody, yeah. yeah. If somebody is going to smash a bunch of granulated sugar and being a huge caloric excess, are they going to gain weight? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. I'm not arguing against that. It's just, if somebody is diet is organized appropriately, whole foods diet, nutrient dense, and then they have carbohydrates as their main energy source and calories are organized appropriately. There's mm -hmm. not a problem. And that's whether you're older than 40, 50 years old. Cause I hear this all the time. Oh, you're, you're in your twenties. These people are in their thirties. They, they can tolerate 
um, all these carbohydrates. But when you're older and you're metabolically damaged, you can't. And it's like mm. when you're older and metabolically damaged, it's actually more important that you are able to, uh, to use carbohydrates effectively mm. than it is to burn more fats. Because the tendency as you get older and as you run on these stress hormones is you mm. push towards fatty acid oxidation, the burning of fats. And this is actually problematic because of what happens when you burn fats inside the mitochondria compared mm. to when you burn carbohydrates. So we want to be optimizing for the burning of carbohydrates that allows us to actually produce adequate energy production, adequate CO2 to avoid oxidative stress inside our cells. Mm. And then also to keep the stress hormones low, which are some of the major components in the aging process. So, the, and the other thing is as you shift people who are, who are older, who have kids, who have full-time jobs, who aren't metabolically healthy to higher carbohydrate diets, you dial in their calories, you make sure their protein intake is appropriate, and you bring down that fat intake, you start to see them lose weight, you start to see metabolic function improve, you start mm -hmm. to see these nagging symptoms, you know, as you mentioned, not sleeping through the night, or mm -hmm. going on these binge and bust cycles where you binge on food, and then you fast and you binge on food, you actually start to see these things minimize. I mean, I have a client right now, this gentleman, when we started, it was around 300 pounds. We've been working together for roughly a month and a half. We're down almost 45, 50 pounds. He was right a type here. two diabetic. He's on, he was, we were starting on hundreds of units of insulin a day. We've cut that in half and he's feeling, he's feeling better. Lipid profile, all this type of stuff is improving. Everything is starting to improve, even though we took his carbohydrate intake to 250 grams per day. Now that's right, not yeah. granulated sugar, but it's, yeah. it's you know, we, for somebody like that, I'm sticking more towards uh, whole food carb sources. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. slamming juices with him because we yeah. can talk about that, but the speed at which the juice or carbohydrate hits the system, if you have metabolic dysfunction, is something that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. But he's improving on this higher carbohydrate intake, and we lowered his fat intake pretty mm -hmm. significantly. And now, you know, all of these values are improving. So I see this time and time again. This is an extreme example, but even with people who aren't at this level of insulin dependent diabetes. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like if you look at, um, you know, like orange juice, for example, and other oranges and other fruits, you know, they've got glucose, fructose, but then potassium too. So like potassium sort of acts is how, this is how I like to explain it because it makes sense to me, but like, it's like insulin helps to push glucose into the cell. So lowers that insulin response in your body. So if you look at it, you know, compared to say a white potato or white rice, you know, it's, it's because of that fructose and potassium. And I think you made a really good point too. It's like, you've got to balance the meals as well. That's another thing I see with clients. I'm like, Oh, let me have it. Like they'll, you know, they'll, they might have an unbalanced meal. So they get that really quick spike in blood sugar. Then they get the low blood sugar and then you're like, okay, well, you probably just need to have a bit more protein and fat with the meal, you know, like say, well, maybe to start with, let's replace the juice with the fruit, like have some oranges and have, make sure you got some protein and fat. And it, it actually, and this is, it seems so simple, but you know, like you say, if you're just getting those calories, right, you're spacing your meals, you know, throughout the day, pretty evenly, well balanced. It just fucking makes such a difference. Like it's crazy. Even myself, I notice it too, you know, cause I've gone through stages where, you know, like the last sort of three to four months, I haven't really tracked my food properly. I've, I've been training, but not hadn't had any specific goals. Um, and just, you know, the other day I was like, well, I'm going to get my shit together. You know, I just want to get a bit more focused and hit some strength goals in the gym. But to do that, I need to really eat more food. Like I have to like purposely and focus on it, but even just doing out the meal plan again, making sure everything's balanced, like just feel so much better. Like it's just, it's, it's amazing. Yep. I think, and that's, that consistency and having this foundational dietary structure dialed in is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And I say this because I get a lot of clients who, and this is not a knock on any practitioners in general. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of clients who come from working with different holistic docs and natural mm -hmm. paths, these, these different, these, these different practitioners, and they focus so much on the supplements, like yeah. supplements, supplements, supplements. Yeah. But what gets that huge difference to people for people is actually dialing the diet first. Totally. Because the you the pro the calories get dialed in so you have enough energy in the in the day you don't have an excessive amount then you have enough protein to maintain your lean body mass your muscle your muscles your bones your skin your hair your nails and it's the right types of protein and mm -hmm. you have enough carbohydrate to power the system so that you're able to you know even if you're not working out the people who I work with a lot of them are not lifting what I like people to lift because you can increase your lean mass 
and the, that muscle mass. And then you have a, a much bigger reserve to be able to tolerate carbohydrates and tolerate stress and like that. Yes, a hundred percent. But for a lot of people, if they're not feeling so well in the beginning, I don't try to push them towards the exercise, just go for walks. And then as we get better, then we can start implementing different forms of exercise and then, then they can tolerate it. So there's different contexts. And then the other thing is you have enough fat so that you can manage your blood sugar, which was a great point that you brought up. If your meals are just, if you just have orange juice and collagen, you're going to be hungry in an hour, 30 minutes, you're going to hit your mm -hmm. blood sugar up. It's going to come back down and you're going to be grazing all day long. And then this can cause issues with blood sugar. And then mm -hmm. this can cause issues with gut function in the microbiome. So we really want to actually have with my clients. I do three, four meals a day, three meals in a snack, keep it there. Don't snack yeah. between meals. If you feel like your blood sugar is low, have something to, to fix that. It's not, you know, this isn't a straight mm -hmm. jacket or anything like that, but in mm -hmm. general, those three or four square meals a day. And then you, when you have that adequate fat, you have adequate digestion, you have adequate hormonal function. I've seen quite a few women actually lower fat intake too low mm -hmm. and then have issues with their cycle. And then we have to get fat back up again because they went way below the target because they're worried about the weight with the carbs. And it's like, just once your calories are dialed in, you don't, you don't have to worry about is this fat or carbs going to make you fat? It's like your total energy intake is organized. Yeah. And then we we're adjusting those other variables appropriately within that total energy intake. Yeah. So once the stuff is solidified, then you, people start to respond to their progesterone or to their thyroid or to the different supplements that they're using. They, they don't even have to use those things a lot of times. And you start to see the weight come down and you start to see the symptoms improve. And then for myself, what I like to do with my clients for my, with myself is I like to set up a general dietary structure. Maybe it's one day you follow every day. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a rotation that you do because most people mm -hmm. eat around the same things and you set it on autopilot and you just run that and you get used to doing that on a consistent basis. And then you can, it basically becomes effortless. And then if you mm -hmm. want to make tweaks, you go back and you make the tweaks and then you go from there. Cause something that you, you alluded to is consistency is absolutely key in this process. And that's making you set the structure up and then you're consistent with it. And then that's where you start to see the, the magic <laughs> happen. Yeah. And I like that. And that's what we encourage our clients to do too, is just, you know, like this week, I mean, I'm busy every week, but like, I've just eaten the same lunch, same breakfast. Um, we've actually even been eating the same dinner the last three or four nights. Cause it's just delicious. We've made this, I made this like a, cause I've got a thermo mix for Christmas. So I minced up some lamb and made these delicious lamb patties with tzatziki, air fried potato chips, chips in lard, big glass of orange juice. And I've just been enjoying it so much. So I said to Craig, are you happy to have this every night for dinner for five nights? He's like, he doesn't give a fuck. Cause he's just like, I don't care. It's delicious. And I don't have to cook. And then ice cream with tin peaches after. So, you know, it's just so good. Like now I'll jump off this podcast with you, just go and throw the, my chicken curry in the microwave, cut up a mango and my dip, lunch is done. You know, I don't have to think. Uh, and you know, if you're eating delicious food that you enjoy, you're not going to get sick of it. And I think I say to women about the whole variety thing, I'm like, I bet you if you bloody tracked your meals for a month, you'd probably go back to the same shit. Like you're not actually having that much variety. So just do it and see how you feel. And then, you know, on the weekends we might go out for dinner or go out for breakfast or, you know, we'll stick to similarish foods, but again, like it doesn't matter you know, if I ate some, a bit of deep fried shit on the weekend, if we went out to a restaurant, I had some tempura fucking prawns. I don't know. Like, it's not going to make that big a deal because it's just what you do most of the time. And you can go out and eat and not think, oh my God, I'm so stressed about eating perfectly or eating too much. And, you know, then you don't binge because you haven't been restricting all week. Cause that's what I used to do is I'd restrict all week and then we'd go out for dinner and I'd just epic binge and drink heaps of booze as well. So I think, yeah, it's just, get excited about how you could feel and make your meal plan delicious and just change it up every week. If you want to, like I usually will change the lunches and change the dinners week to week, but then I pretty much eat the same breakfast. I don't know. I just really like my breakfast. What do you have for breakfast? For me, because I work, I just make myself a shake. So I'll do yep. like whey protein, coconut yep. water, cinnamon, macadamia yep. nuts, a little bit of maple syrup. Yeah. And I'll have a nice glass of juice and I'll have some whole fruit with it. And that's, yep. That's it's your breakfast. It takes five minutes. Yeah, yeah. five minutes to do. I can do it while I'm sitting here working. Yeah. And I'm good to go. Yeah, I'm into, I just love sourdough crumpets and muffins. So sourdough crumpet with butter and jam, eggs with cheese, parmesan cheese and some red onion, fruit, usually orange or banana or watermelon, coffee with milk, collagen, maple syrup. And I'm just addicted to the bloody crumpets, eh? Like, I think, I think there's like a, there's a thousand ways to skin the cat. That's with right. This diet. Yeah. And it's just, once you know the principles, 
yeah. and you dial them in, it's easy to to set things up. And a lot of times, you know, people want variety. It's like you can make variety work, get consistency down first. So you yeah. have an idea of what you're doing. And then you can start to get the sense like the meal template's pretty easy, right? It's mm. a lean or a lean or or a lean protein source, unless it's like beef or something, and then the yeah. fat is fine, and then eggs are fine. So some type of lean protein source. Then after that, we'll have you know some type of carb source that could be a starch and it could be a fruit and and a juice, or it could be one of those things. Mm. And then you have, you know, maybe some for a lot of people with digestive issues, maybe some type of fiber source that could be that fruit, or it could mm. be like the raw carrot or like the carrot salad. And you want to have some type of fat source and that fat source could be chocolate. It could be butter. It could be olive oil, macadamia nuts, it could be avocado. All these things are fine. So you basically, when I work with my clients, I say, this is the meal template. If you want to have chicken parm tonight and tomorrow you want to have roast chicken. And then the night after that, you want to have like corn, corn battered, uh, yeah. chicken, tack, whatever, like that's your variety. Or if you want to do lamb tonight and you want a steak tomorrow and ground beef and tomato sauce the next day. It's all the same thing. Just have your lean protein source, have your carb source, have your fat source and fiber source, and then hit the calorie and macro requirements. Yeah. And in general, for the protein sources, it's all the same stuff. It's usually four to six ounces of protein in a meal three to four times a day. And then the carb sources is variable with the starch and the fruit. So you just have to get the general structure down. I mean, I've made this diet work while I was traveling all over the world. I did it in the Philippines. I did it in Europe. I did it in the US. I'm going to do it in South America. So like you can do this everywhere. Once you have the formula and then you find the the foods that you work with, then you just construct things from there. You can make different types of recipes. I mean, we, the variety that my wife and I do is we just make different recipes of the same types of food. There's like 50 yeah. different ways to make chicken yeah. or beef or fish yeah. or shrimp. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I'm the same. And I think too, when you start to track, you'll start to understand like different meats and their fat content. You're like, oh, you know, bloody pork chops, pretty fatty. That's going to blow my whole budget for the day. So you're probably not going to have that every day. Or, you know, you'll start to like one of my favorites is beef cheeks. They're lean, they're gelatinous, they're not expensive. You can slow cook them really quickly, have them with rice or potato or some fruit, and you can just make so many delicious things. And then, you know, like with the grains, I say to people like just test and measure to find what works for you. So if your digestion is good and you feel good, you know, like have some oats, soak them, you know, every now and then I'll make some homemade baked beans. I just love like really soaking them well, cooking them really well. Not something that I'd eat all the time, you know, um, sourdough bread. Again, find your tolerance level. Like I think some people can eat a slice every day and they're fine. Other people like Craig, he probably have it once a week and that's good yep. for him. So it's finding, I think, like you say, just test. And and again, it's, it is calories too. You can't just smash heaps of fat. Like, Unfortunately, I know ice cream tastes good and all this fatty stuff tastes good, but like it's calories matter, you know? Yep. So those are all really great points. And I mean, on the ice cream piece and the fat piece, I have a client who I work with. She's actually from Australia yeah. and we have ice cream in her diet every night. And she's still lost. I think, well, I think she's a 20 pounds or so. We're yeah. not just dietary changes, no exercise, ice cream's in there but it's just the amount that she's having is reasonable and she's yeah. not binging on it because she's eating enough of the things over the rest of the day. And then on, on the individual tolerance piece, it, that is, there's no way that I can predict anybody's tolerance to different foods. Mm -hmm. So it's, here's the general foods to kind of play with. Here's some ideas of what are more problematic and what's less mm -hmm. problematic. Start with less problematic, add those in, see how you feel, and then see if you can add the other components. I mean, the diets that I build out for my clients are vastly different from myself and vastly different from each other because I'm trying to work with the person's individual tolerance. Because at the end of the day, like for some of my clients, beans are fine. For me, I, I love peas. I eat peas regularly. I don't have a problem digestively with them. Is it a, the a fiber and a vegetable source? And is there some anti-nutrients and stuff like that? Yes. But that doesn't really make that big of a difference if that person tolerates it to their overall perspective. And when you start to get too restrictive and create all these ancillary rules around everything, then the diet becomes unsustainable. And then you start to encourage these binging patterns and these different problems and getting enough nutrients or getting enough protein, carbs, and fat. And so again, it's have under, there's this framework, there's these principles, there's these theories around the different foods, but you have to take all of that and then tweak it to your individual con context so that you can build something that you can use on a consistent basis. And that's where people start to actually get their the benefit and see the results instead of being stuck in some dietary dogma they start to filter it through what's working for me am i reaching in the right direction do i have my foundation solidified 
Mm. Yeah. Like sort of when I'm trying to describe it to women or how I think about it is like, it's a diet focused on nourishment or a nutrition approach, I should say, not a diet nourishment and digestibility. So, you know, when you understand human biology and digestion and you look at these foods, it's sort of inherently like clear that these are the foods that were made for our bodies. And again, not saying that, you know, like nuts, seeds, um, you know, heaps of green vegetables, like grains are necessarily, or they're not bad foods. It's just that I think that like the fitness industry, like they're not good in large amounts because they are hard to digest and they contain lots of anti-nutrients and they're anti-thyroid. It's just, again, like, I don't think we have to go to the extreme of going, you can never eat nuts and you can never eat green vegetables, but just don't only eat. Like I used to do, I'd have like the lean protein, some almonds, some green veggies, you know, no fruit, very little dairy you know, just not much saturated fat at all. It's yeah. Prioritize these foods and then have the other foods sprinkled in, you know, I still will eat some green vegetables. Like we'll have sometimes have some steamed beans with butter, like with the roast. I love, you know, like a nice, like my sister makes this awesome salad and it's got like rocket and um, lemon juice and capers and red onion and feta. And it's so yum alongside, like we have, you know, some beautiful meat on the barbecue and then we'll have some potatoes. So it's just creates this, I don't know, like dance in your mouth of all these like flavors and textures and things, but it's not like just eat a whole fucking green salad with a piece of meat. I think that's where people get a bit confused or women get a bit confused. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I think because so say, say somebody wanted to set up their diet and they were going to do so a lot of women that I work with, Oh, I don't eat breakfast. Okay. And then lunch is that green salad (laughs) with a piece of meat on it. And then it's like, so far today, you've eaten like 300 calories. And most of that is protein. And then make some fat from the salad. And then you wonder why you don't have energy, why you feel stressed out, why there's problems going on with your cycle, why you can't sleep at night. And then you go home for dinner. And then at dinner, usually people eat like a decent dinner because if they have kids, the kids are going to eat pretty well, right? They're going to have some starch, maybe a protein. And then maybe some type of vegetable. And so people eat that. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, now I'm hungry. And that's where the stacking and the binging and all of this type of stuff comes in. And it's because, again, just not eating well across the day. And so it's like if somebody wanted to have a salad, but they had the maybe they had a piece of lean protein and then maybe they had those air fried potato chips you're talking about and they had some fruit with it, maybe a glass of juice. And then they had a salad on the side with some avocado, olive oil, maybe some lettuce and some carrots and tomatoes, something fine. Like that's not the that having the salad with that meal isn't going to ruin their progress, but not having enough carbohydrate, not getting enough nutrient density, skipping breakfast and then binging at night, which is all the same thing together. All of these things are cause and effect with each other is what's going to lead this person to not get the results that they want. And then when you talk to them, they're like, yeah, I don't eat that much. And you open up their chronometer, you open up and look at their diet. And it's like, so you didn't have anything for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then you had like a light lunch and then you had a light dinner and you binged all night long on all these different types of things. And it's like, yeah, you're still in a caloric deficit, but you don't even have enough nutrition to actually support your metabolism. So even though you're in that deficit, you're actually able to lose the weight. Cause again, like it's not just you take food and then it's converted to energy in the body, right? We have these processes. You have to digest that food. Then you have to circulate the nutrients and then you, your cells have to be able to use those nutrients. So if you're short on all of your vitamins and minerals and your con- and your major source is just protein and then you're raising all these stress hormones, well, you're not going to really convert that food well into energy. So the solution is lower the stress, mm. bring adequate vitamins and minerals back on board, make sure you're eating enough for your body. And most times I still have people in a deficit, but it's like, I just spoke with a lady yesterday, Her she's eating 900 calories a day. Her requirement should be roughly 1700. So I brought her up to 1400. And so she's, she's, I increased her calories by 500 calories per day, but she's losing weight. And she's like, how is this possible? And it's like, cause you're still technically in a deficit, but now you're actually nourished and your body can metabolically respond to what you're doing with the diet. And so that's extremely important. People are just like, oh, I'm in a deficit. So I should lose weight. Oh, I'm fasting. I should lose weight. It doesn't necessarily work like that. The body adapts its metabolism up and down depending on the context. We want to do that so that we can continue to live, but this comes at a cost of our higher order functions. Yeah. I also think too, and just, this is from my own experience. I'm not sure your thoughts on this, like 
women will come to me and, you know, they'll be like 90 kilos and like, Kitty, I'm only eating 1200 calories. I'm like, it's not possible. It's not possible. Like you, cause I think we, we restrict and then we binge and we don't track accurately. And once women actually start to track, this is a good example. This is, she was a lady in our program and she's like, oh, you know, Craig's, you know, I was only eating 1600 calories and I wasn't losing any weight. And Craig's got me eating 2000 calories and I'm losing weight. And I was like, well, were you tracking? Oh, sometimes. And not that accurately. And I wasn't weighing things, you know, and I was falling off the wagon and binging. So I think, you know, if you can just let go of that, like fear that it's going to be restrictive and look at it as a way to, you know, optimize your body and nourish your body and think you're going to be able to eat more food and actually build this body that I want instead of, you know, always feeling stressed about food and what I can and can't eat. And I think if you can just submit to the process a bit and trust the process um, and get consistent, you'll fall in love with that consistent consistency because you feel so good and you sleep well and you can train hard and, you know, you can eat this yummy food and not be afraid of food anymore. So yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, it is just, it amazes me every time women do it, but it's because they're getting accurate, you know, and they, they're like so many women too, you'd find this, like they under eat protein, they over eat fat always, yeah. but you just don't know until you track, you know? And even I, I, I've been doing this for 10 years and if I don't track my food, I under eat, I under eat always, always. It is yeah. consistently. And I see that low protein, high mm. fat, mm. like middle of the road, carbon mm. tape all the time and then it's like people turn around and they say you know oh i need to i can't eat any carbs and it's like but your diet's all fat calorically it's, it's like yeah. a 40 percent fat diet and <laughs> the yeah. carbs aren't the problem yeah and then protein super low as you said so yeah I, I see that all the time and i also see the tracking stuff not be correct but i i see both right so i see some women who they're not at the like the 90 kilo mark maybe they're only a couple pounds over their target weight but they yeah. just cannot lose the weight for the life of them. And then yeah. they're eating super small amounts. And then once you get the diet right, then they start to make improvements mm. in their weight loss and all these other symptoms. And you see other women who are, they look like they're eating super small amounts, but when you start to, the problem is they, in terms of food volume, they're not eating that much. Yeah. But when they start to look at the food sources yeah. and see fat sources, and what people don't realize, it's really easy to eat a ton <laughs> of calories from fat because the fat is so calorie dense. I mean, I was on a call with a woman today and we're, she's like, yeah, I go out to, I'm going out to breakfast. And so she was going to one of the restaurants. So I pulled up the website for the restaurant and I pulled up the breakfast that she was eating. And the one meal that she had that day, this one meal alone was 60 grams of fat by itself. Holy crap. And then it had like three grams of sodium and no potassium or anything like this. And it's not nutrient dense. So I'm kind of like, this is just a fat bomb. And mm -hmm it was a 1200 calorie meal alone. Mm. And then based on her, her lean body mass, based on her, her lean tissue, her muscle or bones, her skin, her mm. metabolism could support her weight maintenance, roughly 1700 calories. So it's like breakfast alone is 1200 calories. What are you going to do the rest of the day? Especially mm. when it's 1200 calories and mostly fat. So it's like, that's where the problem comes in. Oh, I don't eat that much. And it's like, yes, but you're eating a lot of calories and yes. it's coming from these, yeah. the, you know, the other thing too, is a lot of people think, oh, carbs are empty calories. Carbs are, you know, they don't have any nutrients. Mm -hmm. Butter, soybean oil, coconut oil, olive oil, these aren't nutrient dense things. It's not that they're problematic, but there's the same problem when most of your calories start to come from the fat sources mm -hmm. without actually getting all of the nutrients. So you want to make sure it's nutrient dense. You have enough of each macronutrient. And it's kind of like there's Goldilocks zones where you're not getting too little or too much. But yeah, it's so easy to overeat the fat. You're right. It's just, yeah, I think. And like you say, when women start tracking and, you know, they realize this stuff and then you sort of build that foundation. So we've sort of got off the bloody topic of sugar and carbs, but that's okay. Because I think we've talked about some good stuff. So maybe to finish off, what is, if, if someone was coming from a low carb diet, transitioning low calories, how would you suggest that they start to eat more carbs? Yeah, this is a great question. So what I usually do when somebody comes from a low carb diet, first I start and see what's their, their total caloric intake. So I dial that in, then I hit their protein target, uh, make sure that's solidified. Protein's not going to change, right? I'm going to keep protein pretty stable. And then that's going to be a structural component. And I'm going to start to adjust carbs and fat. From there, what I start to slowly do is take down the person's fat intake. And as I take down the fat intake, I start to increase the carb intake. 
-hmm. Now, when I first have somebody coming from a low carb diet, I don't just put a bunch of rapidly digesting carbs in first, because if they're burning primarily fatty acids and you start to throw in rapidly digesting carbs, they can get weird blood glucose responses. Mm -hmm. So what I usually do is shift more towards whole food uh, carb sources. So whole fruits, and then some of the starch sources, if they tolerate starch, you know, that could be things like potatoes, that can be things like yams, that could be things like taro or white rice, if they tolerate the white rice. And I usually have that in the context of the whole meal. Mm. Now, once as they start to lower the fat intake, and they start to tolerate the carbohydrates better, and then we're seeing weight is coming down, if weight is a goal, or mm. weight is maintaining, or we're starting to see that their symptoms are improving, then I start to test the water with mm. adding in different types of rapidly digesting carbohydrate sources, things like mm. some juice, and whatnot, and then see how they do with that. And then usually from there, once the diet solidified in that perspective, I start to dial in their micronutrients, because on a lot of these low carb diets, or like carnivore diets, I, people tend to run pretty significant nutrient deficiencies. So you see lack of potassium, lack of calcium, excess of phosphorus, excess of iron, issues with zinc, issues with copper, and then some of the B vitamins and vitamin C aren't that great on their previous diets. So I start to correct all of these components along the way, and also correct things if they have issues going on with hormones or, or vitamin D or things like this. So I'll dial all that in. But usually I see a lot of the bulk or lion's share of the benefit just solidifying the diet. And then, you know, a lot of people coming from the low carb background, find the, the bioenergetic stuff, find Dr. Pete's work. They want to jump straight into hormones. They want to jump straight into progesterone. They want to jump straight into thyroid. And then sometimes people can get pretty bad symptoms from that, you know, like palpitations, anxiety, uh, paradoxical reactions to the progesterone. And so what I tend to do is get the foundation solidified first, and then start to look to those things if they're even necessary at that point. Because one, say you try to push the gas pedal on metabolism with thyroid, but you're in a stress state and you're not eating enough and you're not oxidizing carbs well, and you have nutrient deficiencies, that is going to cause problems. Say your hormones are all out of whack, cortisol is high, DHEA is low, thyroid is low, vitamin D is not corrected. And then there's a, problems with too much estrogen or the progesterone estrogen balances off. And I start to just try to strong arm it with progesterone by itself then sometimes women get these weird responses, right? And so I usually solidify the foundation and then start to bring those things on once we see that things are moving in the right direction if they still need it at that point. And a lot of women find that something like progesterone and whatnot is helpful, even if they're, you know, things are still going well. It's like this like optimization factor that brings them to the next level and helps to or, uh, regulate their cycle and whatnot. So a lot of these things can be quite helpful even if it's not like an absolute need. And a lot of people find think, oh, I need an absolute need for these things when I'm in these stress states. But a lot of times, if that whole foundation isn't right, if this bottom layer isn't, isn't good on the pyramid, when you start to stack things on top and get to the higher layers, you can start to crush that foundation because it's not appropriate. So for me, I, I start with those things first, and then I start to work my way up to that top and get more specific with interventions. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that is probably, we've covered so much good stuff today. So I hope we've inspired you to, you know, just eat more carbs because they're just bloody delicious as well. <laughs> well, cause life is so much better with carbs in it. I can't, this post that I saw the other day, like if you want a happy life, you know, avoid dickheads, not carbohydrates or something like that. I just thought oh, it was so funny, <laughs> but it's so bloody true. Carbs bring so much joy to both of our lives. Um, and as always, don't forget to take a screenshot and share the episode Instagram stories and tag us at Kitty, K-I-T-T-Y-B-L-O-M-F-I-E-L-D. And then each month I pick a winner who gets a tub of Satura premium collagen valued at $79. And thanks so much, Mike, for coming on. I'm sure I'll get you on the podcast again to talk about something else. So I think the other one I wanted to talk about was cholesterol. because I think that's a saturated fat and cholesterol connection. You know, so yeah. many people think they shouldn't be eating saturated fat. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I appreciate the invitation mm. and I look forward to speaking again. Awesome. Thanks so much.